Joel, Joseph, did not fall into a grave, but he was thrown into a pit. And so we want to uh, take up his story. It's found in Genesis 37, uh, and the scriptures are in your notes there if you want to follow along. It says, when they, these are the brothers of Joseph, when they saw him from a distance, and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. And now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say a wild beast devoured him. And then let us see what will become of his dreams. Ha. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into the pit uh, that is in the wilderness here, but do not lay hands on him. That, and he thought that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic or his coat, the very colored coat that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. All right, so there's our scripture. And point number one in your notes that we kind of covered last time, but did a little bit of review, God has a dream, a vision, or you might call it a plan for your life. But in order to fulfill it, he puts us through testing to develop our character. So God has a plan. He gives us a dream, and, and we see the plan, but then there's some testing that goes on before we can actually fulfill that plan. Revelation chapter 3 says this, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. And so it sort of suggests a process. When we become a Christian, we, we go into God's boot camp, you might say, where he begins to reprove us. He, he starts to work on our weaknesses. And he points out things in our life. The Holy Spirit convicts us of certain things. And he begins to work on us to conform us to the image of his Son, and <clears throat> he uses disciplines to do, to do that. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing. Those are the key words, for your testing. As though some strange thing were happening to you. And so what we're seeing with Joseph is, yes, he had a dream, uh, remember, he had the dream that his brothers were going to bow down to him. But there were several years that took place of training and character building that Joseph had to go through. And last time we talked about the test of pride. This time it's the test of the pit. Now, you probably have seen in the news that uh, we're having some trouble over in Afghanistan. And we're trying to get American citizens that have gone over there in good faith, and, and now they're kind of stranded over there, and the Taliban has surrounded the airport, and it's getting real hard for even American citizens to get through that line so they can be rescued out. And so President Biden has decided to send more troops over to Afghanistan to help get these people out that need to, to get out. And what if you thought, hey, I'm going to be a hero, and I'm going to volunteer to go over there to Afghanistan and help get those people home. Well, that's all fine and good, but they're not just taking people off the street and sending them to Afghanistan. If you wanted to do that, assuming you qualified and could pass you know, physical tests, then you'd have to go through boot camp, and you'd have to go through a series of training and testing and uh, physical training, you know, running a mile with the backpack and uh, putting on army boots and, and uh, cleaning a gun and carrying a gun and, and learn all these disciplines we'd have to do in order to go for that mission to help get our people out of Af Afghanistan. 
And so Joseph was being called by the Lord, not that his brothers would bow down to him. I got to believe there was more to that dream that God gave to Joseph. But Joseph focused on the part where the brothers were bowing down to. That's the part he remembered when he was 17. But the total vision that God was giving was that Joseph was called to save not only Israel, but actually the whole world. Because a worldwide famine was coming. God knew this. Uh, but Joseph wasn't ready yet. At 17, he had a lot of things to learn. He had a lot of training and testing to go through. And so now he finds himself in the pit. Now, have you ever th felt like you've been thrown into a pit in life? You know, life uh, has its ways of uh, showing us the pits sometimes and not the cherries. So I think we've all been there. And if you haven't been yet, it's coming. <clears throat> so number two, <clears throat> when we find ourselves in the pits of life, we go through three stages. And we're going to talk about those three stages here a little bit. Uh, and stage number one, first, we blame the people responsible for throwing us in the pit. Who threw us under the bit, under the bus? You know, we want to blame them. We want to point them out. And in Genesis chapter 50, this was even true of Joseph. Because he, in Genesis chapter 50, it's toward the end of Joseph's life. And by then, his father has died. And the brothers are coming to Joseph. And they're kind of fearful that he's going to retaliate for, for throwing him in the pit and selling him into slavery. But Joseph says this to them, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Now I want you to focus on, As for you, you meant evil against me. Why would Joseph even say that? It's because when he was in that pit, he was blaming his brothers to begin with. I can't believe I'm in this pit. Now I see why dad wanted me to check up on these rapscallions. They're evil. They're jealous. You know, I can't help it if I'm dad's favorite. They should get over it. It's their fault. And sometimes we may even blame God at this stage. Hey, God, you gave me this dream. And how you could, have, you could have kept this from happening. Why didn't you step in and save me from the pit? It's all your fault, Lord. Um, sometimes we do that, don't we? We don't see the big picture. We don't see the reason why we're in the pit. And some of us never get out of the stage. And if we don't, we become bitter. And God's plan doesn't work out for us. In fact, we just keep falling into more and more <laughs> pits or get thrown into them because we're not passing this test. And last time we said that God judges us on a pass and fail. And if we fail the test, he just has us take it over again until we finally get the point, finally pass it. Well, when Joseph was there, he was going through this first stage. He was blaming others. And it's just natural to do that. If you're doing that, it's, it's not like you're, you're some weird person. That's just a natural reaction that we have. Uh, Hebrews 12, 15, though, says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. So, Yes, we may point the finger at someone else or, or our parents. You know, if, it just, if I just would have had better parents, I would have turned out better. Well, you know, sometimes we just have to get over that. Sometimes we, we spend all our time looking in the rearview mirror. And for those of you that drive, which is most of you, how much time should you be looking in that rearview mirror? Not much. I mean, it's okay to glance there occasionally to see what's going on behind you, but the real action is in front of you. And if you spent all your time looking in the rearview mirror, you'd wind up in disaster. You'd wind up in a crash, in a ditch, or worse. And yet, that's what some of us do in our lives. We're continually looking backward, blaming people in our past, 
and we're failing to look forward through the windshield to what's ahead, what God has for us. All right, so anyway, that's the first stage, and that's a stage that we need to get out of. But uh, number three says the second stage of the pit is that we begin to assume a small part of the reason why we're in the pit. Well, Lord, you know, maybe I, there, I was maybe 1% wrong, but they were 99% wrong. You know, the, the brothers, they're the ones that, that are, you, you should deal with them, Lord, because, you know, you gave me this vision. David, in Psalm 139, says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, if you think about this prayer of David, and David was a man after God's own heart, don't get me wrong here, but David was having trouble finding anything wrong with him. Search me, O God, see if there's anything wrong with me. Uh, is there any wicked way in me? He was having a little trouble finding anything that he needed to confess. And sometimes we fall into that trap as well. It's easy for us to point out the speck that's in our brother's eye, but sometimes we forget about the log that's in our own eye. That's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. And so uh, we need to come to that point where, and David was doing this, he, he was seeing that, well, maybe I'm a little bit responsible for what's going on. In Psalm 54, still talking about David, he says, against you, Lord, and you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David was in a situation where uh, he had been unfaithful in his marriage, and he had taken Bathsheba, who was another man's wife, committed adultery with her. And then uh, Uriah, one of David's 30 mighty men, one of the men that had been with David from the beginning, one of the men that had defended David and helped to make him king, David had him killed because he had sinned against Bathsheba. He had sinned against Uriah. He put a hit out on Uriah so that he was murdered. And yet David was, well, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. Well, he was getting there. He, that's the first step, is that we're willing to admit, even just a little bit, that maybe we had a part in why we're finding ourselves in the pit. And David himself was in the pit of despair because the baby that was a result of his relationship with Bathsheba was sick as he was born and died within a few days. And so David was very distraught about this. He was in a pit and wondering why. All right, number four, so uh, first stage is we blame others. Second stage is we begin to see that maybe we have a part in this. But the third stage, number four of the pit, is when we stop blaming others and we assume full responsibility for whatever got us into the pit and we resolve to correct our character flaw. You remember the story of the prodigal son? prodigal son, he wanted his inheritance and, you know, I, I want to go out and live life and here I am trapped on the farm and so I want my inheritance now. And so his father, we you know, gave him his inheritance and he went out and he blew it in a very short period of time. But after that, he found himself in the pit. Not a physical pit, but a pit of feeding pigs. And it says this in Luke chapter 15. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. And here's the key, when he finally came to his senses, now that's what the pit is all about. That's why God allows us to go through a pit, is that we'll come to our senses, that we'll wake up. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home 
Even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on, on as a hired servant. And so he returned home to his father. So he came to his senses. He realized that he was better off as a servant in, uh, back on the farm than he was out there on his own. Uh, and so then not only did he think this, but he also acted on it. And he returned home to his father. And so this is why we find ourselves in a pit is that God's dealing with us. He wants us to come to our senses. He wants us to make some changes, which leads us to number five. Uh, we may not be aware that something we are doing is very offensive to those around us and causing them to resist us and our ministry. And so part of living the Christian life, an exemplary life, is that people will be attracted to the gospel. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so this is part of what we are called to do, is to live an exemplary life, a life that will attract others to Christ and not deter them, not... not uh, Make them so they don't want to have anything to do with the church or with Jesus or, or with God. And uh, so here's uh, Joseph, and he was guilty of this. He was guilty of offending his brothers, and he wasn't even aware. I don't think he was even aware of it. Uh, and, and this is not, this is apart from the dream. Of course, they were offended by that when he had this dream that said, you guys are going to bow down to me. We talked about that last time. But there was another thing that he was doing that I don't think he was even aware of that was offending his brothers. And let's go back to the passage in Genesis 37. It says, when they saw him from a distance. So when the brother, they saw him coming. They saw him way far away when he was just a speck on the horizon. How did they know he was coming? And before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. And they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then, come, let us kill him, throw him into one of the pits. Okay, how did they recognize Joseph from afar? It was that blasted coat he was wearing. That coat of many colors, that tunic that he just had to wear everywhere. Now, if you read the passage carefully, and the dream that Joseph had was about they were harvesting the sheaves. And Joseph's sheave was in the middle, and the other sheaves of wheat bowed down to his. Well, that's during harvest time. That's this time of year. It's hot outside, especially in the Middle East. And yet Joseph was wearing his favorite coat. Did you ever have a favorite coat or a favorite shirt or, or something that you just, you know, a favorite pair of shoes or whatever that just felt good and comfortable and, and you just loved to wear it. Well, I believe that's what Joseph had with this coat. It just fit him just right and he, he liked wearing it. He just enjoyed it and he really wasn't thinking about the effect that it might have on, on other people. But you know what the brothers saw every time they saw that coat of many colors? Oh, here he comes. Dad's favorite. Wow, and he's wearing that coat again. I can't stand that coat. Man, oh, she quit wearing it. But he's got to wear it everywhere. He's got to show it off. He's got to flaunt the thing. He, he knows he's the favorite. And he's just putting it in our face. And so they were tired of it. They were sick of it. They hated it. And, uh, and so that was one of the reasons why they wanted to throw him in the pit. They didn't like it. They were tired of it. Now, when I was in high school, I was, uh, had the honor of, of play, being selected to play in an all-star football game. They called, used to call it the Shriners game uh, because it was a fundraiser for the Shriners Hospital. And it was kind of a big deal. We played the game uh, in the Civic Stadium, or what do they call it now? Pro Providence Park, or, or where the 
the soccer teams play. Uh, well, it used to be a football or a baseball and football stadium, so we played the game there, and it was kind of a big deal. And as uh, as uh, a thank you from the Shriners, they gave all of us players, each individual player, got a jacket. And on the back of the jacket was a big uh, emblem that it said Shriners All-Star Football Player. And then on the front, there was an emblem that was shaped like a football, and it had the year that we played, you know, back in the 1800s. Um, and, you know, um, a leather helmet was on there. But anyway, it, it was something that was, it was an honor to have this jacket. But uh, the ja it was a little over the top, I thought. And so uh, it was something that I wanted to keep. And so I just put it in the closet. I even left the wrapper on it. And I thought, you know, someday I'll show my kids this or my grandkids, and, and uh, it'll be a good conversation piece. But I wasn't going to wear it because I thought maybe somebody might be offended by it. And so I didn't wear it. But then 10 years went by, and Ann and I got married. And by then we had a couple of kids. And, uh, I had graduated from seminary. We lived down in Southern California. And I, down there, you don't really need a coat, especially if you're from Oregon and your, your blood's pretty thick. Uh, so I didn't have a coat down there. And then we moved back to, to the coast, to Florence, where I was a, an associate minister. And, and money was tight for us. Um, we hadn't been married all that long, and we had a couple kids. And so uh, and I didn't have a coat. And in order to supplement my income from the church, I was working as an associate minister, uh, I took a job coaching football at the junior high school, the middle school. And so we had a game down in Coos Bay, big long bus trip. We went down there and we played the game. And it, and it was starting, it was, uh, you know, September, October, starting to get cold outside, especially on the coast. And I didn't have a coat. And we were going down to Coos Bay, and so I got to get a coat. And I went home, and I was in a hurry, because the bus was going to leave. And I grabbed that Shriner's jacket, because it was the only coat I had. And so I, I put it on, and I thought, eh, the, the kids on the team, they'll get a kick out of it. And so uh, anyway, wore that coat down. It was cold. And uh, after the game, we would always stop at McDonald's. To uh, for the, the kids, that was the hot. That was a re whole reason for a lot of those kids going to the game was so we could stop at McDonald's afterwards. And so anyway, you know, a whole busload of junior high kids going to McDonald's. Maybe you've been there when that happens, and, and a big line forms. And as a coach, I was at the back of the line, making sure the kids would all, you know, mind their manners and stay in place. And so I'm sitting there. I'm standing in this line for what seems like forever. And a line begins to form behind me. And all of a sudden, I feel a push from behind me. Somebody, like, I thought, well, somebody just maybe misstepped. And I turned around, and there was a fella about my age there. And, uh, but he was looking the other way. And I thought, well, whatever he did, I didn't mean to do it. And then another minute went by, and I, I got pushed again from back. And so I thought, okay, something's going on here. And, I didn't want to cause a scene. I'm trying to keep my temper. But this kept happening. Just little nudges behind me. And I was starting to get a little ticked off about this. And I thought, am I going to have to fight somebody here? And finally, I'd had enough and I turned around to confront this guy. And I noticed as I turned around that there was another guy with him. And I recognized that guy. He was a guy that I had played football with at Western Oregon. He was on the team. I didn't know him very well. He was on the defense. I was on the offense. But I knew his name. And he knew who I was. And so as I turned around, I started a conversation with him. And this guy that had been pushing me, he just kind of was taking it all in. It turned out that those two were attorneys in Coos Bay. And I got to thinking about it afterwards. I thought, why was that guy pushing me? And he was like trying to aggravate me. He was trying to start something. He was an attorney. He could have sued my socks off and won if, he would have, if I would have done something stupid, which I was just about to do. 
And so I thought about there for a while. What? Why was he doing that to me? And then I thought about that stupid coat. And I thought, maybe he saw that, you know, oh, this guy thinks he's really cool, all-star and all this. And so I went home and I took a pair of scissors and I cut those emblems off that jacket. I still wore the jacket because I needed one. But I took those emblems off. And you know what? Nobody was offended after that. I didn't have to get in skirmishes or fights. But this is what Joseph was going through when he was in the pit. I think he, he finally began to think, you know, Lord, maybe I had something to do with this. And he thought about it. And what did they do? It said there, they stripped him of his coat. Why did they do that? Because they hated it. They tore it up. Tore it in pieces. They, they took a blood of, of a goat and put it on there. And they were going to take it back to their father and say, hey, look what we found. Uh, you don't happen to know who this belongs to, do you? And of course, Jacob knew and he came to the wrong conclusion. But uh, as Joseph was in that pit, he thought, I wonder if that coat had something to do with it. I wonder if my pride was getting in the way. I wonder if that's why they threw me in this pit. And I believe that he came to that conclusion because as we go through the rest of the life of, of Joseph, you never see him brag again. You never see him wear a fancy coat again. Even though he's a very handsome guy, it's, we're told later on, uh, he didn't call attention to himself. He developed a servant's heart rather than, hey, I'm coming to check up on you guys, make sure you're doing your job. When he went to work for Potiphar, he became such a servant of Potiphar that Potiphar just flourished. He was blessed. And then when he got thrown into that prison, the warden who was so impressed with Joseph and his servant's heart, he put him in charge of everything. And the prison just ran like, like when Brad was running a prison. <laughs> that good. Uh, and so, and then later when he was called to serve Pharaoh, he served Pharaoh. And Pharaoh put him in charge of everything because he knew that Joseph had his best interest at heart. And that is the heart that you and I need to develop. Especially if we're in the pit. You know, Lord, what was it that I did that caused this? And if there's pride there, or if we don't have a servant's heart, if we'll develop that, then God will honor that and he will bring that to fruition. All right. Uh, to wrap this up, I'm wondering, are you in a pit? Uh, and if you are, is there anything that you need to change? And would you resolve right now to make that change? You know, there's another pit that the Bible talks about, and it is the pit of hell. It's spending eternity, and it's a pit that you never get out of, and it's something I would not wish on my worst enemy. It's the eternal pit of hell. You know what? God sent Jesus to this earth, not to condemn us, but to save us. That if we would believe in him, trust in him for eternal life, that, that we would receive that gift. 